30 uh, by Forbes. And uh, it is an honor and a privilege to uh, have today our uh, CEO and co-founder of Weebly, David Ruzenko. Quick test. test okay. How's it going, guys? How you doing? Like a sleeper. No? How are you guys doing? Yeah? Good? <laughs> All right. Um, so real quick, just uh, about me, I'm, I'm Andrew Pitts. I'm a graduate as well from uh, May of 2009. I work now in New York City as a, a venture capitalist. And uh, this morning, I was speaking actually a few minutes ago here, and this morning I was asked to, to come here and, and ch chat with David. And uh, so absolutely, it's an honor, because you know, I've known David for you know, five or six years now. And, He's an absolute rock star and an awesome guy, and so it's, it's a privilege, and I know you, know, you guys are here to, to hear him speak, and so I'm you know, really excited to be here, and thanks for having me, and you know, I'm looking forward to spending a little time with you. Absolutely, yeah. I guess this, if, um, so I apologize in advance, so if there's any questions, you know, we'd like to get some questions to, uh, I don't have a ton of stuff planned for this, um, but I guess I'd like to start, you know, David, you're a Penn State alum, and you started your business here, right, at school. Um, can you kind of just give a little bit about your background, how you got into it, and kind of how you, you went from student at Penn State to, to, as I understand it, leaving before you finished, right before you graduated, to kind of start with Y Combinator, right, and then gr finishing your degree um, while out there, and how, how that whole worked, and how you got going from sure. the start. Yeah, so, so, so the story how we got started is actually, actually really interesting. Um, I uh, actually grew up overseas. Uh, so I was born in France, and our family lived there for seven years before moving to Casablanca, Morocco, uh, where we lived for 11 years, and then came back uh, for the first time to live in the US uh, here at Penn State. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, um, IST, um, also in the Shriers Honors College. And um, it was uh, the spring semester of our junior year. So, so Dan, Chris, and I had known each other um, at that point. And I was in IST 402 uh, in uh, Dr. Santora's class, and the class project was just to build a web app. And so I thought at the time, for, for about the first 48 hours, uh, the idea was to help students make e-portfolios. Uh, because at the time, there was a graduation requirement that said all students had to create an uh, online resume. Um, and then quickly started uh, just iterating on the idea, got really excited and thought, you know what's really hard, actually, is building a website. Building a website is, is really, really hard. Um, at the time, there was nothing really available that would help you do that. So you either had to know um, how to code or uh, use Microsoft Front Page uh, or Dreamweaver. Those were sort of the, uh, the tools out there. Um, complete disaster, complete nightmare. I remember helping my friend Jordan um, use Front Page to create a website for her astronomy class uh, and just thought, this tool's fucking awful. Like, it really <laughs> sucks. Um, and, and we could do a lot better. Uh, so, so basically started off on that project for 402. Um, and uh, by the end of the semester, we could really tell that, that, that something kind of exciting was coming together. Um, so you know, by that point, Dan and Chris were fully on board. Um, we worked over the whole summer um, while we were all in internships uh, uh, in around New York City. And then that fall applied to Y Combinator. So that was the fall of our senior year, uh, living in 116 Beaver Hill. Um, I, the <laughs> funny story, actually, uh, we, we named all of our conference rooms at our new office, and the nicest, shiniest boardroom, uh, we named it 116 <laughs> Beaver Hill because it's the nicest conference room in our office, and it was the shittiest apartment uh, <laughs> that, 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 that existed. Um, but, but so basically that fall, um, working out of 116 Beaver Hill, uh, was up late at night and reading Slashdot, and read about Y Combinator, this, this program that's um, sort of in, you know, an early seed stage funding program. And uh, the deadline was at midnight Pacific. And I think it was around 1 a.m. Eastern, so I had about two hours to get this application together. Um, so I didn't have time to call Dan or Chris and ask them if they wanted to drop out of school with me, move to San Francisco. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I put both their names on it anyway. And, um, and submitted it, I got it all together, I submitted it with about half an hour to go on the deadline. Um, called them up the next morning and asked them if they wanted to drop out of school and move to San Francisco. And interestingly, Chris just like, was like on the spot, uh, was like, yeah, sure, let's do this. Um, and Dan was like, uh, you know, it sounds really, really interesting, let me, let me call my parents and get back to you in two yeah. hours. Um, so, uh, but then we went to interview Y Combinator, got accepted, and then skipped out our last semester here uh, at Penn State, so, so that was the uh, spring semester of our senior year to move out to San Francisco. Um, luckily, actually, all three of us were able to uh, finish our degrees 
Um, it just took Chris five years longer than the rest of us. Um, <laughs> But but he graduated. Uh, He's over here for those. He who graduated don't know. a couple years ago, um, so congrats, Chris. <laughs> now you're just a boring old college grad like the rest of us. Yeah. So so along those lines, how do you uh, how do you value the the education that you receive here versus going out and getting real world experience? How do you kind of uh, you know, work, I guess, uh, kind of, you know, live in that balance. How, how, how do you see that working? For, for some students here who may be, I'm not advocating this, but may be considering the same, uh, same path. Sure. So, what, I mean, I think the easiest way, really the best way to learn is to do. Right. Um, and th what, what, what I tell people all the time is if you're thinking about starting a startup and you think this is something that might be interesting to you, it, it, it's not for everyone because, frankly, it's, it's incredibly challenging. It's just so much work, also incredibly fulfilling. Um, but if, if you think you're interested, what's the worst case scenario? Like, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? Well, the worst thing that can happen to you is that you try, you learn a hell of a lot, and you end up with a kick-ass resume, right? Like, that's the absolute worst case failure scenario is that you have one of the most amazing resumes out there, and you will end up getting an amazing job and learn so much more in such a compressed amount of time than you otherwise would have. So, um, so I think, you know, just taking a shot and getting started is absolutely worth it. And, uh, you know, if anything, you will just learn so much more than, than you would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I hope this doesn't embarrass you too much, but uh, I want to get into kind of a, you talked about, you know, how, how much work it is. I guess, can you talk about that first. Let's back up. How, you know, talk about kind of the early days, how much work it was, you know, you and Chris and Dan putting all this time in. Um, you know, what was that like? Talk about that experience because it, it really is a, a full, you know, 20 hours a day, is it like that? How, what were your experiences there for those that, yeah. that are looking into this? So when we moved out to San Francisco, we, um, we were pretty much working every waking hour. Um, and our one rule was that we would take off Saturdays. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, um, we just wouldn't work on Saturdays. So starting Friday at like 10 p.m. till about noon on Sunday, we wouldn't do any work. Um, but other than that, we'd pretty much work every waking hour. We would work until um, we were tired and then go to bed, which was usually around 10 or 11 a.m. Uh, then we'd <laughs> sleep until uh, we woke up. Um, fu funny story, I actually started, um, about six months in uh, when we got to San Francisco, I started dating um, uh, my wife, Brooke, and she was going to law school, so she would wake up around 8 a.m., and I'd be going to bed around 10 a.m., so we'd have about two hours of overlap in the morning. Um, but, um, but it's not the type of thing where, uh, you know, it's not like, you, you wouldn't put in that same kind of work if you're working for IBM, right? Because it's, it's really not the same thing. It's something that, you know, you obviously start the company because you believe in it and you're passionate about it and you want to work as much as you can because, because you're just, all you want to do is just see this thing make it. Uh, so it, it is really one of the coolest experiences. So, okay, so this then perfectly leads into my next question. Um, so for those that don't know, I met David many years ago, four or five years ago, five or six years ago. Um, and I guess you must have been dating Brooke at the time. He's now married, so we can give him a round of applause for that. Um, and as I, I saw, it's on Facebook, so it's public. Uh, he is expecting his first child. So can we give him a big round of applause for that? So that leads to my next question. You now have two full-time jobs, right? You have 100% devotion to Weebly, but you have a wife and a future boy or girl, I'm not sure which, but one of the two, obviously, right? We'll find um, out soon enough. Um, and, and so you have, again, two full-time commitments. And when you look at, at kind of the entire you know, tech startup ecosystem, you've got companies really pushing maternity and paternity leave. You have you know, Mark Zuckerberg writing an open letter to his daughter and taking time off from Facebook, where he you know, works all the time. How do you balance that now? And how do you go from all the time except for Saturdays to, oh, I've got a wife and, and a, a baby on the way, and, and eventually you, you know, a baby I have to raise, how do you kind of balance that in, in, when, you, when you have, again, 100% on both? Sure. No, and, and, and that's actually a really fantastic question. Um, I don't know that necessarily everyone does it well, um, but, but, but certainly it's something to strive for. Um, you know, and I think the answer is different for everyone. Um, you know, we've been at this, so, so we graduated in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, we've been at this now uh, for coming up soon on, on 10 years. Um, and, you know, I think in those early days when, when we were working every waking hour, I mean, that was sprint mode, right? Like, that's the 400-meter sprint. Um, you know, when you've been going at something for 10 years, you can't keep sprinting that fast, right? So I do take weekends off now. Um, but, uh, but, but, but I think striking the right balance is, is difficult, but definitely possible. Um, so every, every Tuesday night is date night, uh, and I don't miss it for the world, right? Like, there's nothing, there's all kinds of things that come up. And always, uh, date night takes priority. So I think there's little things like that 
Um, you know, just really making sure you keep the right balance. Um, but it, it's it's still a hell of a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And when you, is, is there anything, or how, what is the process then in place for if something catastrophic were to come up during date night, how do you how do you handle that? Is it something like when you go out, you put your phone away, and that's it, doesn't get touched? Or if there was something catastrophic, I mean, obviously you have a great co-founder in Chris, and you've got Dan that can handle these things. But do you have kind of like a, a plan that you've put into place? Because I know you're very structured in how you've done things. Uh, what is that like if there is like something catastrophic? Because that's again in our world, we we plan for that kind of stuff, and so. Sure, I mean, there's always you know there's 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 always sort of catastrophic, rare events that come up. So. Um, you know, luckily there, there really hasn't been too many of those. Um, but, you know, of course, if there's, a, if there's a huge emergency, you deal with it, you know, whether it's with work or, or at home. So, you know, I come from the venture side, so, um, and I was you know, earlier here talking about that. Um, how, for a lot of uh, people in here, they either have raised money or they're going to raise or, or they want to do, they want to get into a startup and someday might have to. What was that process like for you? Coming from the entrepreneurial side, you know, you went to Y Combinator, which gives you some seed capital and sets you up on a path to go. Um, you raise money, and then you have kind of an interesting history that's a little bit different than, than many startups. But how, I guess kind of the, the first initial like, rounds. So what was that process like? What did you learn from that? How did that work? Sure. So we, um, when we moved out to San Francisco, part of the deal with Y Combinator at the time, um, now it's more money, but at the time uh, it was $20,000 um, for a team of three. Uh, and... What that meant is living in San Francisco, we were living off of, you know, the three of us lived about four, four, to, four to five months off that $20,000. So wow. it, it was really an effective salary uh, each of like $20,000 a year is what we were living off of. So we didn't really, you know, and rent's not cheap in San Francisco, so we didn't really have a lot of money for other things. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so, so from there, we moved out to San Francisco in January. Um, in April, uh, we raised a 650K round from a bunch of angel investors, Steve Anderson, Ron Conway, um, Mike Maples, Iden. Um, and that lasted us uh, all the way through um, basically uh, December 2008. So, so this is kind of an interesting story. So we, in about January 2008, we sort of look at our bank account balance. And you know, it's going down every month because we're not making any money because at the time, actually, Weebly was just completely free. Um, so we, you couldn't pay us money if you wanted to. Um, and so we're, we're looking out at our projection and said, well, you know, we're probably going to run out of money around September. Um, so we'll probably have to go raise another round. Uh, but, you know, it'd be cooler than raising more money would be if we became profitable. That's like way cooler. Um, that, that's, uh, you know, I know it probably doesn't sound like heresy out here, but in San Francisco, that's kind of a weird thing to do. Um, Across the startup community, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, so, so we, um, and, and the correct term would be cash flow positive, probably not, not, not profitable, but, um, so, so, so we set to work on Weebly Pro. That, that was the first, you know, that's sort of the, the start of our business model. Um, where you could upgrade to the pro subscription uh, for additional features. Um, we launched that in June of 2008. Um, I remember, uh, so, so you know, you, you guys should definitely come uh, check out Steve and Emmett and all those guys tomorrow. Um, I remember being in our apartment, we were all taking bets on like how many millions of dollars we were gonna make as soon as we launched Weebly Pro because clearly it was gonna be incredibly successful. Um, and I remember when we launched it, the actual results were 10x lower than the lowest estimate. Uh, so it, it, it wasn't exactly super strong out the gate. Um, so we're like, okay, that's cool. You know, we'll, we'll probably have to raise another round. Um, and this was, you know, June of 2008. Um, we're making a little bit of money now, so we weren't gonna run out in September. We we're probably gonna run out maybe around October, maybe November. Um, we went out to raise money. Now, if, if you recall, uh, the uh, fall of 2008 was not a great time to be raising money. We, we moved into our first office, and literally that same month, Lehman Brothers collapsed and started this huge, I mean, it wasn't them that started, but this huge crash of the, of the uh, global financial system. They made a great movie about it like, <laughs> a couple months ago called The Big Short. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, I, haven't seen it. it actually is a great movie. Um, so, uh, so we did get a term sheet, but um, you know, basically an offer to invest. Um, but we thought it valued the company too low, and, and we said, well, you know, now it's not really October, it's maybe November, so, you know, we're kind of close, why don't we just try to squeeze through, right? And then September came, and then October came, and then all of a sudden it wasn't November, it was December, and, and things were kind of like, we were like close to break even, but, um, but I remember around December, we sort of had this emergency founders meeting, and... We were, we were at the office late at night um, on a Sunday, if I recall, um, at, at about 1 a.m., and we're like, okay, 
we're not going to be able to make payroll next month and it's due in like a week or two. Um, basically, we can't pay our bills next month. Like we're out of cash. What are we going to do? And so we basically got out this calendar um, for January and we said, all right, like which, like we're not going month by month where we can pay our bills. We're going day by day now. You know, like exactly what's our daily bank account balance going to be based on which bills are due when. And then we said, we split all of our bills into two type of bills. We basically said, what are the bills that like if you don't pay them, someone really angry calls you up? <laughs> it's like, great, we don't have to pay those bills. <laughs> <laughs> what are the bills that if you don't pay them, they shut off your servers and cut off your internet and your site goes down? Definitely have to pay those bills. Um, so, you know, we, we, we just mapped it out and, and, and we squeezed through. Um, and you know, made payroll. I mean, it wasn't an option. We were obviously going to make payroll. Um, we had actually, as as the three of us had had just started paying ourselves salary. Um, so you know, one option was always just to go back to, to the way it was before, living off twenty thousand dollars a year. Um, and, and we would have totally done that. Um, but we squeezed through. And um, January two thousand nine was the first uh, time that we became cash flow positive. Um, and actually, the business has been cash flow positive ever since. So you know, we raised uh, about two years ago. Now we raised a thirty five million dollar round from Sequoia and ten cent. Um, and still haven't spent any of that money. Um, so, so the business is still cash flow positive. I think, I, I think that's kind of one of those really unique uh, moments in the business. Yeah, that's, trust me, from, from my side, that's one, incredibly hard to do, and two, extremely unique. You see startups all the time that raise a ton of money and they just burn it, right? They think that if I get a ton of money, I'm just gonna blow through it. Um, what you've done, is, again, seriously, you need another round of applause. That's incredibly hard and it's incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, but, but you mentioned something, just to back up a little bit. We were talking about September of 08, October of 08. You said you were growing a little bit, the money was you know, coming in a little bit more, a little bit every month. What were you doing um, from kind of the growth side? What were you doing to bring that money in? Because again, you know, again, from my side, I see it all the time. I project, I see an entrepreneur and they send me a financial model and it says, we're going to do this. You said you were 10x lower than your worst projection, your weak case. That's pretty much how it happens all the time. I and mean, we had a company that, that I'm looking at that we're already invested in that, that missed their, their numbers by like, you know, $30 million or something. I mean, it's incredible. So we, we got some work to do there. Um, so, and it comes down to like the growth. What are you doing to, what did you do then kind of to get that, that yeah. growth command? So we, well, I, it, it was really just Weebly Pro. So we launched Weebly Pro and, you know, there was some upgrade paths. And, and really it was, it was a factor of, the, of, of, you know, just people signing up. So at that point in time, you know, it, it actually took us a really long time um, before uh, our signups really started taking off. So, so you get, you know, you hear in the press, there's all these like overnight success stories. Yeah. It's like person launches, startup explodes, like sold for a billion dollars within like three months or some shit, I don't know. But like that's the way the press makes it sound all the time. Um, that's not the case at all. It is incredibly rare for that to happen. Um, you can almost count on one hand the number of startups that have gotten really successful really fast. Um, it's actually much more often that someone puts in years and years and years of work. You know, Pinterest was supposedly this overnight success story, except for the fact that Ben tried like five different ideas uh, before he finally tried Pinterest. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, it, it was, you know, I think it was only around the summer of 08 that really signups kind of started taking off. And when signups were taking off and then we launched Weebly Pro, um, there was sort of this just natural, organic, word of mouth growth. Um, and, and, and that's really what sort of propelled the business, you know, to even to date, um, you know, we, we do some advertising, you know, we have some TV ads and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it's still the large majority is just word of mouth, you know, people really excited about the product, really happy, and then go and tell all their friends. So we're uh, kind of looking a little bit towards the future then. What is kind of the next step for Weeb? I know you're iterating on the product, but wh where do you see it going and, and kind of what's the future path on, on the product side and, and on the business side? Sure. So. Uh, that's actually a really interesting question. So, you know, we started off talking about how Weebly, you know, the, the initial idea was just make websites and like making websites hard and it should be easier. Um, and then a couple years in, um, we woke up one day basically uh, <clears throat> with like a million users and no real idea why people were building websites. We're like, okay, a lot of people want to do this, but what are people building? And so we, started talking to them. And we started asking, you know, what are people, and what we found out was really fascinating. Um, two thirds of people building a site on Weebly actually consider themselves an entrepreneur. Um, and, and, and these are people starting businesses. These are people who, you know, have some idea. And actually one of the hardest parts as you're starting your business is the technology side, which is, cra which is crazy. It's, it's, it's mind blowing, but, you know, but, but getting online, e-commerce, all that stuff is, is some of the hardest challenges that people tackle as they start their business. Um, and so, you know, the way we see it is, 
you know, to, to really zoom out and like, what are we working on for the next, you know, 10 years plus? Um, our mission as a company is to help the world's entrepreneurs succeed. And, you know, that I think is a very long-term mission. So, you know, it, it, it started, I think step one was website. You know, ha half the businesses in the U.S. still do not have a website today. Half which is crazy, wow. half. Um, and, and, and that's in the U.S. It's even worse outside the U.S. Um, so really step one for me is the website. Um, but maybe that's the most boring step uh, because you get a website online, it's actually really critical. Now all of a sudden you can get found, you know, you can attract customers, you can, uh, you know, tell them all about your business and, and, and help start to drive sales. But step two is way more interesting. That's where you set up an e-commerce store. And, and that's really the next step, which is, you know, whether you're goods or services, whether you're shipping things to people uh, or a yoga studio, um, <clears throat> transacting online is, is so powerful because all of a sudden your business starts to run itself. Now all of a sudden you go on vacation, you're still making money. Um, and, but, but that's really still just step two because then after that, okay, great, I have an e-commerce store, but now all these gazillion things that all companies need online, right? You have um, things like I want to do advertising, SEM, retargeting. Um, you know, I want to do analytics and understand where my customer is coming from and why and what are they buying. Um, I want to do customer support. I want to do fulfillment if you're shipping things. Um, you know, the list really just goes on and on and on and on. And so, you know, our longer term vision is can we create a platform uh, that takes all of the technology hassle out of starting a business? So if we could make it easier for people to start a business, like whatever it is that you're good at, you know, like, like one of the ones that comes to mind is, um, is, uh, is, is, is Betty. Um, she's uh, 77, I believe. Um, she bakes amazing chocolate-covered pretzels um, and sells them online. Uh, this is, it's not Social Security, like this is what's paying her bills. And, uh, and she's the pretzelprincess.com. Um, you know, she knows how to make amazing chocolate-covered pretzels. Um, but she wouldn't have any idea about how to start hand-coding a website um, and, and, and to get her business online. So if we could create a platform that encourages more and more people uh, to get leverage through technology and to get their ideas out to the world, that I think is really exciting and we have a lot of work left on that. So do you give her a free Weebly account as long as she sends you a box of pretzels a month? Is that how it works or no? Not, not quite, but that's an awesome idea. Yeah, okay. she, she, she does send us pretzels off into the office. Okay. Uh, and what about the, the future of kind of the, the business on, on kind of the business side? Um, you know, what's the next step? Do you continue to grow profitably? Do you raise more money um, to, to really add more fuel to the fire? Do you go public? What, what are your kind of plans there? If, if you just kind of, what are your thoughts on kind of like that? Sure. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so we're just, you know, kind of continuing to grow and, and, and continuing that march, um, you know, to accomplish that long-term vision. Um, you know, today we're uh, about 325 employees. We have offices, um, four offices, uh, San Francisco, Scottsdale, New York, and recently Berlin. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, even more exciting is, uh, you know, about 250 million people every single month that visit a Weebly Made website. So just in the U.S., it's wow. over a third of the U.S. Um, population every single month that visits a website made on Weebly. Um, so, you know, really it's, it's you know, we're not going to raise any more money. We, we, we haven't spent, you know, a dollar of the $35 million that, that, that we raised two years ago. Um, but, you know, again, our, our big focus is, hey, can we um, help people with more? Can we get there faster and, and really continue the, the march on to, you know, building a platform that really enables, uh, you know, everyone to, to, to go into business for themselves and become an entrepreneur? You mentioned just now you're opening an office in, or you've opened an office, excuse me, in, in Berlin. How important is international to Weebly's growth? How, how important is kind of getting out there, getting to Europe, make sure you know, Weebly is, is in you know, Australia and Asia and South America eventually? How important is that? Is, is the international part of, of your business to your, your ultimate overall growth? Sure. So, so, so we don't actually break out specific figures, but, um, but, but you know, we're, we're already a hugely international business, and it's, it's really, really important to us. So you know, already quite a bit of our business is outside the U.S. Um, so... Uh, you know, Ber Berlin is sort of, you know, just the next step on that strategy. Okay. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, I know, uh, you know a lot of people in here are, are, are either entrepreneurs or future entrepreneurs. Um, one thing that is always concerning about business, and there's kind of two schools of thought, and it's, it comes into competition, right? So there's, there's Weebly, and it's, it's an awesome product. I'm actually a user. I've used it multiple times. I actually ran a charity company using Weebly. Um, we sold over $50,000 worth of a plaque kind of honoring um, my, my late football coach, and it was an awesomely successful project, and you know, thank you for helping make that possible, because um, I couldn't have done it without that, because I don't know how to build a website. Um, and so, but, you know, doing, there's Weebly, and again, a great product. You have, you have Wix, and there's a couple others, of Squarespace. Um, how do you how do you view competition given that there's kind of the the cautiously paranoid 
view versus the I don't care at all, I'm just gonna keep my head down and do my thing view. What kind of advice would you give to entrepreneurs versus like when you look at, at kind of others in the market? How do you, how do you see that? What do you, you know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure, I mean, we, we have lots of competition, you know, WordPress too, Shopify, um, you know, even even GoDaddy, you consider competition um, in, a, in a strange way. Um, but I think, I think competition like really truly validates the space. So, it, so if you do not have competition, um, then that is usually an indicator that, um, that the market you're in is not very big. Um, you know, any big market and, and something that's worth doing, you know, you're not going to be the only person that has that idea. You know, I, I like to think we're all sort of basically finite state machines. We all get relatively the same inputs, right? Like we're watching the same news, we like watch the same stuff on TV. Like it's no surprise that, that we like spontaneously, a lot of the inventions happen like spontaneously by multiple different people, right? And so, um, so I think it, it's a, actually a really bad sign if what you're working on doesn't have you know, competition that's also working hard on it and very successful. So for us, I mean, you know, I think it's awesome to get out there and compete. And you know, really, uh, great competition really validates the space. Do you, don't, you don't get worried at all about if you know, you're trying to compete for that user that's looking between the three or, or so and you know, it doesn't worry at all? You just kind of? No, I mean, I mean, I think we compete very effectively. Um, you know, we, uh, you know one, one of the coolest things that, uh, that, that I don't know is like super widely known, but Weebly is actually the only CMS, uh, like content management system, the only platform where you can edit your site or your store from a mobile device or a tablet. So we have both iPhone and Android apps that have the full Weebly experience. Um, literally for all of our competition, you need to be sitting at your desk, you know, on your laptop or desktop, which to me is, is just crazy. Um, again, shifting gears a little bit. Again, I, I want to stress to everyone here how really impressive what David and Chris and Dan have done. Um, it's, I know it gets kind of glorified in the news, the guys like you know, Zuckerberg, they drop out of school and they start a company and they're really successful, but it's not as, as commonplace as, as they make it seem, right? Most of the entrepreneurs that we've backed are guys that have years of experience in the industry, they're, they're older, they've done it. What things, given that you're such a, a rarity and such a success story, what things kind of, I guess, what were some of the things that led to your being able to, to do that and now run a company that is, is valued so highly, has 300 and some employees, 325 employees, so you said, um, you know, and, and for Chris too, what, what, is, like, what were some of the keys or what are some of the things that, that kind of got you to that point that have allowed you to be so successful right out of school on your first try with almost no industry experience working elsewhere and kind of learning? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think the keys, it, it's, it's, it's actually, I'll tell you exactly how to do it and it sounds really stupid. Like, it sounds really basic and stupid, but... Um, but here, here we go, here it is. Um, number one, just get started, right? That will put you ahead of probably 95% of people. Um, everyone loves to daydream and talk about their ideas. Uh, almost no one will actually get started working on them. So, so I think just getting out there, getting started, you know, you start working on your idea, it's fine, it's not gonna take off overnight, right? It's not like the day five you work on it, it's just gonna like become an instant success, right? But, but um, but actually, so, so for that, I mean, it's like work on side projects, like get out there, start building stuff, learn to code, um, crit critically important. And when you actually start making things, you just learn, you start that learning cycle. So that's number one. Um, once you've gotten started, congratulations, that puts you ahead of 95% of people. Um, number two, just don't stop, right? It's like, it sounds really stupid, but most people give up after three months, six months, like they just don't keep going with it, right? And it's not like, it's not like we, got to where we are today by like some, it's not like this flash of brilliance or inspiration or this one or two superhero moments. Like all it is is you wake up every morning and you make a little bit more progress. And then you go to bed and you wake up again and you make a little bit more progress, right? And you just keep, keep walking and you don't stop and next thing you know, like you've, you've run a marathon. Um, so I, I, I really think those are, those are the two key steps that you know, the large majority of people just won't do. And let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about failure. Because um, that's it really, it's not something you can really talk much about, right? Because you haven't really been that. But you certainly, there have been things at Weebly that haven't worked. Um, again, on the, on the aggregate, you're extremely successful, and that's that's awesome. But but some of the, the things you've done, um, you know, pl uh, marketing plans or, or product features, whatever, don't work. What do you do? How do you handle that process? How do you handle kind of that failure? What do you learn from it? How do you kind of go about that? Because this this game is truly all about failure, right? And it's it's you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, and that's the thing, right? Like starting a company, the very large majority of companies um, will fail. Like like statistics are on that side, right? Like I think it'll it's something like over ninety percent, right? Like nine out of ten aren't going to work out. That's okay. I I think one of the most amazing things about Silicon Valley 
is that failure, in a sense, is celebrated because it means you got out there. Like you, you know, sort of that analogy of the gladiator in the ring. Like you went out for battle. I'm sure you know this, right? From from uh, from playing players. football. You know, oh, okay. like 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 plenty of people can can. You know, when you're in the arena, plenty of people are talking about, oh, he didn't do that right, he didn't do that right, or whatever. But but um, but it takes a certain character to just get out there and um, make it happen and do your best, right? And you know what? Like, if you lose a game or if you have some failure, you know what? Just, like, pick yourself back up and get better and go back at it again, right? And, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Like, it's actually, you know, to my mind, I've tried and failed is, is super admirable, right? To not try at all is, I think, uh, you know, regrettable. And... You know, many of the, the people in here that are either entrepreneurs or going to be, they're, they're at a very early stage. And that's, that's an assumption, so I apologize if I'm wrong with that. But um, you, know, you obviously are at a much later stage. Can you talk about uh, the aspect of managing people? Because you came out of IST. You're a technical guy. You know how to code. But you're also really freaking smart at business. And you've obviously done a great job managing people. And so has your, your entire team. Um, how do you go from kind of, you know, we had three guys at Y Combinator or started at, at you know, my apartment here. Uh, was it 112 Beaver or 116 Beaver? 116, yeah. 116 Beaver. Um, to, I have 325 employees now. How do you, what are some challenges in managing and how do you kind of go from like the hands-on role to like the manager role? And, and what are some like keys or advice you could give to people that, that maybe aren't there yet, but, but if, as you guys start things and get out there, you will get there someday. How do you, how do you talk them through that? Sure. Um, no, it's 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 a really fascinating question. I mean, I don't claim to have all the answers. You know, it, it's it's um, it's I think it, it's sort of this constant journey of of learning and self improvement. So the, the the way I like to describe it actually is is that about every year my job just completely changes. You know, a, as we're growing quickly, and and it's really funny because you know the things that make you good at one job, right? Like actually turn out to those specific things make you really bad at your next job, right? And um, so you have to constantly learn to reinvent and, you know, just to be self-aware enough to track. Um, I, you know, I think specifically with managing people, um, it's a, uh, it, it's just, you know, if, if you get in that position, um, don't feel bad. Like, literally everyone struggles with it. The only way to learn, um, you know, how to, how to effectively manage teams is, is by doing it. Um, that's the only way to learn. You can't, you can't read a book. Um, it, it just, you won't understand. Um, but, but basically, if you, if, if you start a company, um, Understand that probably around about when the company's about 30 to 40 people is when uh, you're going to feel like you're going crazy and uh, enter a complete emotional meltdown stage, um, and it's completely normal. Um, and the, the, there, there's a really big shift in transition that, that you have to go through. It, it, it's really funny if, if you hear any, if you hear any like any of these these wonderful blog posts written about like how completely flat organizations are perfect. Like I could predict to almost an exact count like how many employees are at that company, like 37 signals, like for the longest time was like, you know, it, it, it's like you're between 28 and 32, right? Because that's when it feels the best, right? And um, you're moving quickly, but then it, it just, it's like 35, it's broken, just over, overnight, instantly it's broken. Um, you know, the, the big shifts are um, really about, really about trust um, and empowerment. Um, you know, one of the, um, you know, around that time we, we had basically trained um, you know, for that first phase, phase, actually, micromanagement is good. So, so, so up when it's just a few people, you know, you need to have your hands in every single detail because you, it is, if you don't have quality in every single decision and every single thing that you do, um, you will go under, right? And then you get to a stage where you just cannot make every decision. You cannot, um, you know, over, you know ha have an overview of everything going on. It, it, it's at about 35 people. Um, and the, but what you've done is you've trained your entire organization to come to you for every decision, right? Like, like the smallest, stupidest, most frivolous decisions, right? Like, oh, hey, we're having a happy hour. Like, what color do you want the napkins to be, right? Like, 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 like people just, like, this is what you've done. You've trained them, like, I make all the, you know, it was the three of us. Like, we make all of the decisions. Um, and so around that time, basically, um, I, I, I remember um, hearing something from Richard Branson where, 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 where he said, you know, someone asked him, how... Can you possibly run like 30 different companies? Like, how is that possible? He said, well, it's really simple, actually. I hire the best people in the world, and then I trust them to do their work well, right? And so around that time, you, you know, really have to shift uh, to um, train people to start making their own decisions. And um, the, the, the one phrase I, I would just use over and over and over again was like, you know, uh, Nick, um, I trust you. You're smart. Don't fuck it up, right? 
And simple three steps. And really, those, those are the three key things to communicate, right? And just explain. Um, I also like this analogy. There's this analogy of um, knowing which are the rubber, if you're juggling a bunch of balls, which are the rubber balls, which are the glass balls. And there's something powerful, you know, when you toss a glass ball over to someone to be like, hey, that's a glass ball, and I'm not going to make a dive catch. Like, if you drop that ball, like, it's your responsibility. If you drop that ball, it's going to shatter, and that's going to be on you, right? And surprisingly, people put a lot more effort in not to drop that ball um, when they're aware that you're not, you're not there to catch it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that's really, I think, the very first major transition um, is, uh, is really to start, you know, empowering and trusting people to make good decisions and, and, and to do their jobs. And back to your, your three keys, I won't you know, repeat them, but I think you guys got what they were. Um, are there any other keys, just kind of key things that you think of that they haven't, we haven't talked about that are necessary for success? Or just three things like, you know, what are, what are some of the things you do that have made you successful? You know, routine, whatever it might be. Um, you know, just things to share that are kind of, you know, best practices in your industry or whatever that, that you can kind of share with uh, these aspiring entrepreneurs or, or current entrepreneurs. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one pro tip, uh, just sort of general life pro tip, uh, is, um, you know, sort of where, wherever you are, you're going to have someone you look up to, that you report to, you know, whatever it is, your boss. Um, I think it, it, it's this, it, you sort of, be, having been in that position, what you realize is that person is also just a human being, and they're also really busy. Um, so uh, they, you know, I, I think some of the smartest and most talented people that, that, that have worked for me um, show up day one thinking, how do I make your life easier, right? Like, how do I take work off your plate? How do I, um, you know, make things easier for you, right? And, and, you know, instead of just bringing someone a problem, right, they say, like, hey, what can I take that will, um, that, that, you know, take something off your plate and, and how can I handle that? Um, I think that mindset's actually really powerful and, and, and if you go into, uh, you know, wherever it is in life, if you sort of go in with that mindset, um, uh, you know, that, that, that's sort of one thing that I think will, will help you be successful. And uh, I guess this is probably the last question. I want to you know, open it up so the audience has a chance to kind of get what they, they want uh, answered. But um, I know this usually isn't really your personality or the team, but here's your chance, uh, brag. Tell me like some great statistics about Weebly. Share some updates, new things you're excited about. Uh, you know, what are you doing? And like things that you feel comfortable sharing. Um, just, you know, brag about it a little bit. Because obviously I, I want everyone to understand the magnitude here of how really successful you and your team have been. I mean, really seriously, from college campus or, or, or downtown apartment to now a company that, you know, I can say this, their last private valuation round was $455 million, and I'm, that was two years ago. So it, it's pretty easy to figure out that it's somewhere may, way, way north of that now. Um, so to build a company from literally nothing to somewhere close to 750, a billion, two billion, whatever it might be, is extremely, incredibly, like, awesome. And so, so brag a little bit. I mean, uh, tell me about you know, how many sites are in Weebly. Or just, I don't know, just, you know, here's the floor and brag a little bit about what you're doing. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, one more for the humble brag than yeah. the overt brag. Okay. Uh, I, feel, I, I feel like I've already launched a bunch of statistics at, you know, uh, at, at all y'all, so, so I don't need to, you know, necessarily repeat anymore. But, but I think, you know, uh, kind of to close, um, you know, I, I think that it, it's just, it's such a cool thing uh, to get out there and try to start your own company because, um, it, you know, I can tell you, it, it is really like the best experience in the world. It's not easy. You know, it's not like every day you're going to wake up, it's going to be the most amazing day of your life. In fact, it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. But, um, but I think that, you know, if you even have the suspicion that it might be something that you're interested in, I'd say just go for it. Like, get out there, but get out there aggressively, right? Like, get out there, get started, start working on it. Um, you're just going to learn so much, and at the end of the day, you know, you pick an idea that you're really passionate about. Uh, it, it, it's it, it's 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 an incredible feeling. It's a feeling like no other to to make something, right? To something that didn't exist and now it does, and you did that, and um, and I think it is just the most tremendous learning and experience, um, j just the most incredible experience. So if if you even suspect that might be something you're interested in, I, I highly encourage you all just to get started. Don't talk about it. Just get started. Get working on it. Um, you, you won't regret it. All right, great, thank you. Um, I guess there's, there's questions online possibly, or? No, none yet. Uh, does anyone here have any questions for David? I'd like to open it up and kind of tailor it to what you guys want to know. Just shout it. The question was, when you repeat it, or? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so the question is, you know, the second suggestion is never stop, but what if you face in the wrong direction? That, that, that's actually a really, um, Fantastic question. Um, that uh, is, 
uh, more art than science. Um, I think there's, you know, you, you definitely don't want to keep blindly plodding along on something um, that, that has no value. Um, so that is definitely bad. Um, that said, mo most people tend to give up too early. They tend to err on that side as opposed to work too long. I like the large majority of people, I have seen it happen that people work too long on a really bad idea. Um, but most people tend to give up too early, which is why I sort of talk about that side. Um, I think you, you know you're heading in the right direction um, when you have people really excited about what you're building and they keep coming back. Th those are really like, that, you know, it's, it's, it's called product market fit. It's, it's knowing that you might not have scale yet, you might not have a lot of people, but, um, but, but it's basically, you look at the number of people who come in the front door, and if that's non-zero, that's already a good start. Um, and, you know, the faster that's growing, the better. But then the next thing you look at is how often those people return, right? And so, you know, I, th I think this applies probably to almost any business. I mean, you, you open up, you know, a pita shop downtown, and if people keep coming back, that's a good thing. It means that people like your product. Um, so, so I think if you, if you have people showing up in the front door, you have some word of mouth that's kind of spreading, and you have people coming back, then I would say things are definitely going in the right direction. Yeah, so that's also a really interesting question. So, so the question is, how do you know when to launch? You know, how do you know when it's good enough? Or like, because you just, you want to launch something perfect. So, so, so how do you know? Um, th this is also a question with no precise uh, right answer. Um, but, but the framework that, that, that I really liked was um, from Paul Buhite, uh, who created Gmail. So, so it was the guy who wrote Gmail um, while he was working at Google. Um, also came up with the don't be evil slogan. Um, his advice is to launch as soon as what you have is better than anything else out there. So if what you have, it might not be perfect yet, but you know, because the standard advice is true, like you know, work on an MVP, minimum viable product, like launch early because um, the, the standard mistake people make is to launch something, or, or sorry, not launch something, uh, keep working on it because you know in your head, like you have this perfect confidence that what you're building like is going to be perfect and you know exactly what people want and like you just need to make it perfect and get it out there and like people are gonna be tripping over themselves to show up at your front door, right? And that's not usually the way it works. Like usually the way it works is, uh, I think for literally everyone, is that you launch something um, and then like maybe you convince like 12 of your friends to try it out, like really got to twist their arm and like, you know, buy them some beer or something like that to try it out. And then none of them are going to come back and use it again. That's usually how it works. And then if you have a really good friend, then you sort of act, like you really push them, you know, maybe your mom, you know, like why, why, why are you not using this? And then it'll be like, well, I actually don't really want it, right? Or, or I don't really need that or, you know, but then you get that feedback and then you're like, okay, well, why, you know, how could it be more useful, right? Because usually you have this idea, like, you're solving a valid problem, maybe you're just kind of pointed in slightly the wrong direction. So then you iterate, and then you iterate off, and okay, I launched, like, that was V1, like, you know, the alpha, like, V2, V3, like, fourth, fifth. You, you iterate just as quickly as possible, and then, then you sort of correct your course uh, so, that, so that you're facing the right direction. Um, and, you know, but... But you don't want to, so, so you do want to launch early, but I also think if you launch too early and what you have is literally useless, um, then there's no point to it. Like, why would anyone use it if there's better options out there? So, so I really like Paul's advice, which is, you know, launch as soon as what you have is better than what else is out there. Yeah, um, so, so getting into YC is hard. It was hard, it still is hard. Um, I don't know if it's harder now versus when, when we got in. It's certainly a lot smaller um, when, when we got in. Um, it's, I mean, it's intense. It's like you, you fill out this application. Um, they now have you sort of video yourself and sort of tell your story, a five minute video. Um, you know, if you make the cut, you get invited in for an interview. Um, it's, you know, I think ours was I believe ours was 12 minutes uh, interview, so you have 12 minutes to, to convince a few people that, uh, that the idea is worth funding. Um, I think it's down to five minutes now. It's like really fast. Um, and you know, so you give it your best pitch and then, um, and then they, they give you a call that night and let you know whether, whether you're gonna get accepted or not. 
Um, and you know, the terms are standard, you know, it's all the same terms. Uh, and then if you do get accepted, um, you know, their requirement at least is that you move out to the San Francisco Bay Area uh, for the program, which is a three month program, three, three and a half months. Um, and then after that, most people stay, but, but you're free to move back. So, so that's kind of a little bit, you know, I think now they, um, I think now they give you $120,000, uh, you know, which is a bit more than the $20,000. Um, but, uh, but, you know, that, that's sort of the program in an overview. No, go ahead. You're right. Sorry, you're up. You're next. Yeah. yeah uh, you mentioned the time where you were writing out a, a run white, and then you were you had to choose between bill and bill and what to pay for and what not to pay for. Uh, why didn't you turn to a VC or something like that that would have a game run way? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the question is, you know, when 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 we were running out of runway, you know, running out of cash, um, bank account was looking really low. Uh, why didn't we just turn to a VC or raise money? Um, you know, it, it was, it was, uh, there was really two moments um, when we got really, really low on cash. Um, one of those was around April of 2007. It was the end of the Y, y Common Air program. Um, we, I remember we got to a point where we had less than $100 in our bank account. And that was like, luckily we had done like a big old Costco trip and like stocked up on like, you know, huge like barrels of ketchup or whatever you get from Costco. And, um, and uh, so we had food, we had like ramen noodles, uh, and, but we had 100 bucks left, less than 100 bucks left, and we had rent coming up in two weeks, and so that was like kind of a dire situation. Um, you know, at that point we did raise funding, so, so we raised 650K from a bunch of angel investors. Um, then, then it was in December of 2008, it was sort of the next time that, that, that we got really low on cash. Um, yeah, I mean, at that point it was, you know, the financial crisis just hit. We actually did get a term sheet, um, you know, an offer to invest, um, but we didn't think it valued the company uh, you know, as highly as it should. And, you know, frankly, we were pretty stoked about um, just uh, becoming cash flow positive and controlling our own destiny. So I think, you know, th there are a lot of very um, valid reasons to raise money. Um, you know, it, 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 I mean, it can be a really great thing. I think that, you know, the, the discipline of becoming cash flow positive, growing off your own revenue, I think um, is, is super cool, right? Like it just brings all kinds of um, discipline in your spending, discipline, you know, all around um, that, that, that I think is very, very positive. So, um, so yeah, for, for, for us in 2008 through 2009, um, you know, we decided to become cash flow positive, you know, through launching Bluebee Pro, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, has there ever been a security breach? Um, you know, luckily we, you know, not knock on wood, I, we haven't had one. You know, Chris is uh, pretty fantastic um, and, uh, you know, keeps things pretty secure. But, um, but yeah, that, that, that is something that we think a lot about, uh, frankly, is, um, you know, making sure our systems are secure uh, and, and we pay the proper attention to uh, security. So, so that's, you know, pr probably better uh, to have Chris answer that question, but, um, but that is something we spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So, so it's how, how does the competitive landscape change the day-to-day -day ways in which you do things? Uh, you know, we, we got really great advice early on from Paul Graham, uh, I believe, and, you know, the advice still applies uh, today to us, which is, you know, it, it's, it's just a lot of people really stress about competition. Um, frankly, it's just not super helpful. Uh, it, it's, you know, it, you, it is so unlikely that you will get killed by your competition. It, it, it's you know, for how much pe attention people pay to it, it's much more likely that you will die of your own uh, doing um, than, than by being killed by competition. I mean, the number, it's, it's just, everyone worries about like, oh, what if Facebook, Apple, Google, like come and like stomp our idea. I mean, we, um, you know, Google tried to compete with us twice and we kicked their ass. Like they, 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 they launched Google Pages and then Google Sites and they both sucked. Um, so I think um, it, it's, you know, it, it's just, it's almost like instead of, focusing on the competition, just focus on being the best you can, right? And making sure that you are just building the best product with your own original thinking. And uh, that's really how to play the game, not sort of looking in the rear view mirror at, at what everyone else is doing. Rent, booze, uh, 
Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm just joking. Um, the, uh, it, it, yeah, so, so it, it's hard to conceive of like, 650K is so much money, and it's hard to conceive of where it all goes, but, um, but surprisingly, I think for, for almost every single business, like the number one expense usually is salaries. Um, so people, paying people is really expensive. Um, you know, uh, the, there's all kinds, it's, it's the fully loaded cost usually of employing someone is somewhere between, depending on where you have your office and how expensive your perks and all that, but somewhere between like 1.5 to 2x their actual salary when you pay for the employer side of the taxes and all that stuff. So let's say it's 2x. Um, you know, if you pay someone $50,000, it costs you 100,000, right? If you pay someone 100,000, it costs you 200,000 as, as the company. Um, so yeah, the boring answer is like the large majority of that just goes to, um, you know, hiring people, building the team and paying salaries. Anyone else? We have about 15 to 16, 17 minutes left. Any other questions? Oh, oh, here we go. Some more. Go ahead, go ahead again. Uh, so, let's see, like, when you, when you guys compete legally relatively and no competition, I'm trying to refer to the market almost so to speak. So, now it seems like as technology progresses, that innovation is going to get smaller and smaller. The rules will change all that. This idea, but no one really has it. So, what's your advice on entering a market with a startup that maybe is in an industry that's already dominated by somebody else? Yeah, no, that that's a great question. Um, I think. So, so the question is, uh, you know, as you get started, there's like this open window. Um, but, but would you enter a market where there's already lots of competition, or like, 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 how do you think about that? Um, and, and probably more broadly, like, how do you think about choosing a market to enter? Um, I think, uh, you know, as far as competition goes, um, you know, a lot of times you wouldn't want to jump into a very crowded market, but like that rule is broken all the time by the most successful companies. Um, you know, Google jumped into the search engine market and that was incredibly crowded at the time. Um, Dropbox jumped into the online file storage market and that was incredibly you know, crowded at the time. Um, so I think there's plenty of counter examples that show that you know, if you can build like a 10x better product that entering um, you know, a crowded market isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, in terms of how you choose a market, I think that um, the, the, I mean, the number one tip that is very, very true is, is it's easier to ride a wave. Uh, so if you can find some kind of rising wave um, and ride that, it'll, it'll make your life a lot easier. So, I mean, current, you know, current waves, I think, um, are VR. Um, uh, you know, there's they're, they're sort of, you know, the blockchain um, is another one, although, you know, that, that's, that's still pretty hot. Um, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, data and analytics. Um, so I think, you know, just sort of finding an emerging um, market. Actually, one, one of my uh, good friends, uh, Tim, uh, is working on a startup called Fearless um, for VR, which is really cool. It's, it's the idea that he could help people get over their phobias. So he, he had, like, crippling arachnophobia. Uh, and um, he, you basically strap on the Oculus, the Rift, and it starts with the spires are kind of far away, and then, they, and then they get a little bit closer, but they're cartoony, and then they get closer and they're like real, and then, you know, but little by little, you, you kind of get over it. It's called exposure therapy. Um, before you know, like, they're crawling on your arm in VR, and it actually translates to real life. His demo uh, for the YC Demo Day was he brought two tarantulas out of the jar and had them crawl all over himself, um, and he's not scared of spiders anymore. Um, so I think there's, you know, fi finding, uh, you know, sort of a wave to ride um, is super helpful. Um, and there's just, there's still so much, like so much opportunity out there. I saw a couple more, but I want to give a, we have an online class watching. I want to give a, a shout out to them and take a question from someone that's, that's watching. So go ahead, Jake. Um, so one of the questions is, what was the toughest moment for you at Weebly? The type of moment that almost made you just quit and be done with it, but you managed to continue? Hmm, good question. Um, the toughest moment. Um, you know, I mean, I, mean, I think, I think that the way I sort of describe it, I don't think we've ever been close to quitting. Um, the way I sort of describe it, I mean, there's lots of tough moments, you know, there, there's, there's ups and downs and, um, and, and, you know, being, if, if you've been in that seat, you'll know that being an entrepreneur is a frickin' roller coaster ride. Um, and I think it's so, the, the emotional swings are so high because, you know, think of a wiggly curve like this that's going up into the right. Like, it's heading in the right direction, but the problem is, as humans, we really like to extrapolate from the data we have right now, right? And so what happens is when the curve, the, when the line's going up, you extrapolate 
shit, like we're gonna take over the world, right? And then as soon as the line goes down, like draw that and you extrapolate like we're, we're, we're you know, going to hell. Um, so I think, um, you know, but, but for us it was always, I think kind of just a blind optimism. Like I think optimism is really important for a lot of things in life, um, you know, including uh, leading a team um, and also including starting a company. And so for us it was just, you know, we were kind of young, like, you know, impressionable and excited um, and just kind of optimistic. And we just knew this thing was going to work um, and we were just going to keep working at it. Uh, a couple more. Uh, start and we'll come down the line. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Uh, great question. Um, so uh, it, it's it's interesting because I think when you're really really small, you know, it's just the three of you. Like for us, we all three did everything, right? So we were like this little boy band, like traveling in the car, like you know, whenever we went to talk to investors, like it was the three of us always that would show up. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's like the absolute right way to do it. Um, it's just it was so exciting that we all wanted to be involved. Um, you know, now we've actually split off our responsibilities, um, you, you know, pretty cleanly. And uh, Chris handles, you know, all the um, infrastructure side, the security. I mean, he, he um, you know, the, the, the website, you know, literally our, our servers never go down. Um, you know, the sites are always up. We have, like, tremendous uptime, and he makes it look, you know, absolutely, um, you know, pain-free and, and makes it look really easy. So, um, you know, so that's really fantastic, and, and, and he handles that area. Um, then, you know, Dan, uh, chief product officer, and so he handles, you know, the whole product and design and roadmap and, you know, kind of a lot of the vision around the product. Um, and then, you know, I'm sort of the, uh, you know, the, the, the everyone else uh, sort of uh, guy. Um, so I, I, I do think, you know, by the time you grow to a certain size, you know, cleanly dividing your responsibilities, you know, ultimately is healthy and, and helps you focus, um, uh, you know, just on doing that specifically. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, good question. So the topic of balance, how do you balance running the business day to day and raising money? Um, the short answer is you don't. <laughs> when you raise money, you will not be able to get any work done, um, like when you're in that process. Um, and I think it's pretty universal, and I've thought a little bit about why that is. And I think it's because when you're running the business, especially as an engineer when you're like coding, like that's what you're doing, you're staying up late coding, um, uh, like programming is... Uh, you think a lot about constraints, right? So you think about edge cases and constraints, about all the things that, um, that could go wrong or how they could go wrong. And, 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 and then your whole mindset's about constraints. And when you're raising money, your whole mindset's about possibilities, right? Because you start bringing up constraints in an investor meeting, like you're DOA, right? And so, um, and so in that mindset, it's really about what things could become, right? And I think that unfortunately, they're like opposite mindsets. Because if you bring your constraints thinking um, into an investor meeting, then you're not, you're not selling the vision, right? But if you have this possibilities thinking, you know, when you're trying to code, it, it's just, you, you, it's going to blow up in your face. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, for many reasons, and I think that's the primary one, it, just expect that while you're raising money, you probably will not be able to make progress on your business. So uh, the best idea is to try to raise money as quickly as possible, get it out of the way, because raising money inherently does not create value in your business. It's actually, you know, doing the work um, that, that, that the customers get value from, and that's what creates value in your business. Um, how long has your vision and vision statement changed from the beginning to Sure. So the question is, has our mission and vision statement changed? Um, for the longest time, we uh, did not have a mission statement. Um, I, I've personally always found mission statements to be, like, a little gross um, because they, I don't know, they just seem so inauthentic and they are way too long and they're built by consensus to please everyone, you know, like there's this word global because we got to make that part of the company happy um, and we don't want them to feel ignored. Um, and so uh, anyways, that I think for the longest time we didn't really have one. Um, and I think it was actually a really fantastic thing when we did build one. Um, we, uh, you know, I think mission statements on the whole can be really long and, and, and complex and, you know, not helpful. Um, but you do remember the best ones, right? Like everyone knows uh, Google's mission statement is to help organize the world's information, right? And everyone knows Facebook's is to help people get more, more connected. Um, and so, you know, we were sort of inspired by that to say, hey, can we take something that really boils it down to the essence of what we're trying to accomplish 
and gives us a really long-term true north to where we're pointed. And so that, that, that's how we came up with you know, our mission statement, which is to help the world's entrepreneurs succeed. Um, we came up with that probably about five or six years ago, and, and it hasn't changed a word since. Uh, did you? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so the question is, is, is VR the next big thing? Like, what do you think about it? Um, can, we, can we have a quick show of hands? Has anyone tried, like, the Oculus? Who, who's tried it? Okay, that, actually a lot of people have. Okay, so by, um, so, so, so sorry, keep your hands up, and then lower your hand if you think it's not gonna be world changing. Okay, I think we had no hands lowered. <laughs> um, so, it, maybe one back there who's lowered half. Um, it's when you try it out, like I would highly recommend, like if you have anyone that you know, um, try out the Oculus, it will blow your mind. Um, it, it, it's, it's hard to describe it, but you feel like you're there. Like it, you have all those feelings of presence, like if you're physically somewhere. Um, the, the, the two like classic examples, there's this roller coaster demo, um, like your stomach drops out, literally, when the roller coaster goes down, right? And the, the other ones, there's this demo where, you know, among many things, this sort of like big box floats up and then kind of shoots at your head. 100% of people duck. Like 100% of people duck. It, it, it gives you that feeling of being there. So I don't know exactly how and how, how it's going to evolve, like what's going to take off or if it's going to take off to mass market. I just know that eventually it, it's, it's pretty freaking incredible. And, um, you know, something big is going to come out of it just because, I, you know, once you try it, like you'll understand. Yeah, so, so, so how do we see Weebly growing with VR? Um, you know, the, the answer is I don't know uh, yet. Um, I think, you know, VR is still in the very, very, very early stages. Um, it's like, you know, what, you know what's really funny about, about the dot-com uh, days, like the 99, 2000, 2001, um, is a lot of those ideas actually were good ideas. Like, sort of after the crash, everyone's like, oh, those were shitty ideas. Like, it was just a big, like, f fuck up. Um, but... Uh, but it actually turns out some of those ideas were really bad ideas. Um, but some of those ideas were really good ideas. It was just the fact that not a lot of people were using the internet back then, right? Like that, like, like there was a very small number of people using the internet. Like bandwidth was really, really low. Like everyone's on dial-up. Um, it, it, you know, the the stack wasn't there. There's was no AWS. There was no like sort of what we consider modern programming languages. Um, and so. You know, I think, you know, ser you know servers, um, you know, like the, the capacity is like you had to have a, it was really expensive. So, so basically it was just that everyone was a little bit too early to the game, you know, was, was sort of, now that's not to say there weren't some really bad ideas because people got super irrational. It, it was just that those were early days. And I think now you give it another 10 years, you know, it's, it's sort of the internet has come to realize that potential and that vision. Um, you know, Oculus is probably now around 1994. Um, so I think it's still really early, um, maybe like 96. Uh, so I think it's probably still really early, which is risky getting involved. It's, you know, pro and con. Um, but it's probably going to be, if it really takes off, it's probably going to be three or four or five years for that adoption cycle to really ramp up. Um, and so in the meantime, you know, you're going to have this sort of the early adopters, but, um, but you won't have mass market adoption probably for a while. Go ahead. And then So what is Internet 3.0? Yeah. It's the first I've heard of it. Sure. 
Sure. Um, so, so, uh, so kind of the, the Internet 3.0 um, is basically sort of the rise of cloud and data and VR and, and all those things. Um, I think, um, you know, our, our mission, what we're trying to accomplish, really holds true across mediums, right? And so I think, you know, we, we, we will go out there and whatever medium people are using, you know, you build your website today, you have an e-commerce store where you're selling things. Um, that works really well through no effort of your own. It happens automatically whether that shopper is on their mobile phone, whether they're on a tablet, you know, even if they browse a website on their TV. Um, so I think you know, the core of what we're helping people with is you know, can we basically provide the technology platform that helps you start you know, and grow your business and be successful? Um, you know, that I think applies you know, no matter what the medium is. So uh, you know, we, we even have an Apple Watch app where you can, um, you know, it's, it's pretty cool actually. It'll notify you every time you get a sale. You know? so, um, uh, you know, I really think that uh, you know, we're sort of always looking out and seeing what's out there. You, it's not always best to be first to something, Some, sometimes it is. Um, but really, whatever medium, you know, whether it's VR or you know, anything else that, that becomes popular, um, you know, I think we're still going to you know, uh, continue to execute on that vision of creating this technology platform that people can use you know, to bring their ideas to life. We have one way in the back. Do you still have a question? Go ahead. Ah, so the question is, how do you know if it's the right timing for your product? These are all really fantastic questions with no right answers. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. So in the VR example, right, like would this be the right time uh, to launch a VR startup? Um, or uh, another good one that a good friend of mine is doing um, is uh, a uh, weed startup in San Francisco. So a lot of people think that cannabis will be legal very soon. Um, and it's certainly medically legal in California and in many states. Um, so is that market like, it's, but it's not legal yet fed federally. Um, so is that market, you know, are you early to that market? Um, you know, the advantages of starting earlier are that, um, you know, a lot of times person who gets that first mover advantage, who gets in on something early, um, you know, will become by de facto the dominant player unless they screw it up. Um, the disadvantages are, you know, you might be way earlier than you realize. Uh, so you may be three or five years too early. It's really hard to keep going for three or five years without any traction. Um, this is a very common thing that happens all the time. You know, people come with these great ideas. It was like five years too early. And then next thing you know, like you thought of, you know, Snapchat and, you know, now you're not, you're not Evan in, you know, the mansion uh, in LA. Um, so I think like that that one there's really there's really no right answer. It's you know too early is bad, too late is bad. So I think you just you know you want something that's that's really going to grow big to a mass market audience, and then try to time it you know ideally a couple years before that. All right, uh, I think about last question. We're about out of time. So. How important would you rate search, en search engine optimization for new businesses? Yeah. So the question is, how important would you rate search engine optimization or SEO for new businesses? Um, critical. Uh, SEO is critical. Um, there's lots of tools on Weebly as you set up your site or your store um, to do um, basically SEO. Uh, but it's you know it's it's critical. You know if you can get the right keywords in place and you can optimize your site, um, you basically just get free customers from Google, right? Or from from Bing or who, I don't know who uses Bing, but uh, but um, but from wherever people are searching. Um, and you know otherwise you'd have to pay for those customers. So it's basically like you know free organic uh, search is incredibly powerful. So, so I'd say it's, it's one of the most important things that people do when they start their business. All right, hey, uh, thanks David, thanks everyone. Um, can you guys give them a round of applause? Uh, thanks for yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for letting me hang out. Uh, also, if you want to be entered uh, for another chance to win the $10 gift card, uh, you can uh, fill out the survey at this link and uh